welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense and his clear, open heart. In order to continue presenting these podcasts, we need your support. Please go to mindpodnetwork.com slash jack and you can donate there or you can go through our Amazon or Audible affiliate links. And that's another great way to support the podcast. Thank you for your generous attention. So tonight I want to talk about one aspect of the mystery of being a human being, of human incarnation, uh, what is called uh, karma vipaka in Sanskrit, um, and has just become the kind of borrowed English word karma. Um, and I want to do it because over the last weeks I've, when I have been teaching, I've done other kinds of more contemporary talks of, about mindfulness and things in the world, and it seems useful periodically to hold up some of the traditional uh, teachings in a way that I think serve people. Um, I want to start with a poem. Um, I'd read a poem about sleeplessness some weeks ago, and this is a different one related to the same topic. Um, by one of my favorite poems, poets, Ellen Bass, called Insomnia, particularly for those of you who know that state. All over the world, people can't sleep. In different time zones, they are lying awake, bodies still, mild, minds trudging along like child laborers. They worry about bills. They worry whether the shoes they just bought are really too small. <laughs> One's husband's died, her son left for college, and she doesn't know how to program the VCR. Another was beaten by her husband. One is planning a getaway, one holding stolen goods. One's on the plaid couch in ICU. His daughter, it turned out, actually does have a tumor, even though the doctor said they'd do the MRI just to rule it out. The woman on the other couch is snoring, which is strangely soothing, evidence that people do sleep. Some are lying on charisma sheets, some in hammocks, some in jail, some under bridges. One is at the North Pole studying the impact of pollution. A man in Massachusetts thinks about a lover he once had in Dar es Salaam and the jasmine blossoms she strung along the shaft of a silver pin fastened in her hair at night. Coincidentally, the lover, now in Rome, remembers looking out the window over the sink when she was washing dishes and seeing him reading in the lawn chair, and she thought how, perhaps for the first time, she wasn't lonely. They're all up. Some are too cold, some too hot, some hungry, some in pain. Some are in hotels listening to people having sex in the next room. Some are crying. One, the cat woke up, and now she's worried about the rash she noticed in the evening and wonders if her daughter, who's afraid to swim, should be pushed. Some get up, others stay in bed. They eat Oreos or drink wine, or both. Many read. A few make Halloween costumes. Some check their email. They try sleep tapes, hypnosis, drugs. They listen to their clocks tick smartly as a woman in high heels. Those who can cling to their mates, an ear pressed to those neighboring lungs like a stethoscope, hoping to catch a ride on the steady sleep breath of the other, <laughs> to be carried like a seed on the body of the one who is able. Right now in Japan, dawn is coming, and everyone who's been up all night is relieved. They can stop trying. In Guatemala, though, the insomniacs are just getting started and have the whole night ahead of them. <laughs> It's like a wave at the baseball stadium, hands around the world. So here's a prayer for the wakeful, the souls who can't rest. As you lie with eyes open or closed, may something comfort you. A mockingbird, a breeze, the smell of crushed mint, 
Chopin's nocturnes, your child's birth, a kiss, or even me awake at 3 a.m. in my chilly kitchen with my coat over my nightgown, thinking of you. <laughs> so here we are in this human condition that she gives her poetic voice to with longing and beauty and love and loss and possibility and all that's so mysterious. And then you say, well, how do I navigate through this complicated life that I've been given? And one of the most important understandings for navigating is the understanding of karma or karma vipaka. Um, Without it, you're like a boat without a rudder. You kind of get pushed and drifted around without this understanding. And I remember the first visit that the Dalai Lama had to America. It was back in the 70s. Um, And in his first American trip, he was invited to give a lecture at Harvard Divinity School. Um, And because he was at Harvard, and we were on this great big auditorium, old auditorium at Harvard, I think because he was at Harvard, it was Harvard, right? He decided to give this long, impossibly difficult to understand arcane lecture from the Madhyamaka teachings of, of um, the, the Geshe PhD philosophical training that he'd had um, uh, for an hour and a half, all these intricate things about the nature of mind and emptiness and shunyata and so forth that almost nobody understood. Um, it was like, okay, you guys have some knowledge here. Let me try this out on you. See how you like that. You know, it's Harvard. And then when he finished, you know, and it was beautiful. It was like this, this kind of amazing piece of music and art Um, and deep, deep kind of contemplative philosophy. Then he said, well, maybe you didn't understand this so well. And he laughed as he did. He said, no, no, no matter. He said, maybe anyway, not so important. Just maybe you study karma. (laughs) And then he laughed. (laughs) And that was kind of the end of it. Okay. (laughs) But how do we study karma? How do we understand it? Um... You know, it's become so much a part of our lexicon that you hear it, I heard it on the radio, you know, come in to buy your car at this particular car dealer in the East Bay because we've got great sales and it's, you know, whatever, John, somebody's car. It's his karma to sell you the best car at the lowest price and it's your karma to come in and get such a good car, you know. Or this ad that I saw, quite genuine, um, in uh, the Bay Guardian that said, want to be rich, you know, those kind of ads. Fabulously wealthy, really rich. Let's face it, the only way to fabulous wealth is to be born into it. Well, you've blown it this time around, but now there's a way. The reincarnation connection next lifetime guarantee. (laughs) Just send $25 to the address below. For our gar- with a guaranteed check certificate. And you can also check the box if you want royalty, sports, fame. We promise to deliver or your money back. Right? <laughs> so it's become part of our culture in some way to use the word. And there's an amazing Buddhist text called the Avatamsaka Sutra in 25 volumes that describes all the possible experiences of consciousness in different universes. Not just this universe, but universes made of perfume and universes made of fire, which if you haven't noticed, a lot of galaxies have that. Universes made of um, stone, universes made of um, light, all different kinds of universes. They all have names and they all have Buddhas in them. And the teachings in all these universes are the same that if you plant a mango seed, you get a mango tree, you don't get an apple tree. And that the, the laws that govern creation itself is that there is a pattern of cause and effect, that things arise due to causes. So this is the, um, a passage of the Buddha speaking. He said, if a, Man plays upon a lute, 
the musical notes do not appear from a storehouse of hidden notes, and when he stops, they do not return to any place else. They arise from certain conditions, the body of the lute, the strings, the training and exertion of the player, and then when those causes and conditions change, they cease, leaving no trace. In the same way, the elements of being, physical and mental, arise according to conditions and then cease and become non-existent. So he's really describing the way the patterns that experience happen. If you plant a mango seed, you get a mango tree. If you take a acorn, you get the... In that acorn is all the oak trees that ever were. You know, and you plant that little thing and then it becomes a seed, they get a sapling and a great oak tree, and then there's another acorn. Well, are they the same or different? They're actually the continuation of the oak tree pattern. You can't even say which is the real oak, can you? It's all this pattern in form and consciousness. Zen poem. Break open a cherry tree and there are no flowers, but the spring breeze brings forth a myriad of blossoms. So things arise due to the patterns and the causes and conditions. Now all this sounds sort of theoretical. We'll get down to it, I promise. Right? We don't see these patterns. We tend to live inside them. I was visiting my grandmother at her old assisted living place, um, and she was about 90. And I noticed when I would go and spend time with her that it, down in the lobby where people would gather to play cards or talk or watch TV and so forth, that there were two distinct groups of people. There were the people who had basically cheerful temperaments, and they'd sit around and they'd watch TV or they'd talk a little or they'd sit quietly, they'd enjoy one another, enjoy the day. And then there were the other group that my grandmother was a part of who were the <laughs> professional complainers. You know, did you taste what they served us for food for lunch today? Oh my God, yes, and the portions were so small, that kind of thing, right? And, you know, yeah, the postman he was supposed to bring, but I haven't heard anything. Do you hear anything from your family? They never write. And it was just on and on and on. And you could kind of see the patterns that had developed over a lifetime manifesting themselves in the minds of those people. So we're talking about conditioning here. Um, and the way, the patterns that repeat themselves in your psyche and in your mind. And then they form your personality. Oh dear. Right? Like my grandmother. In fact, somebody asked the Lama Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, you know, if there's no solid self in Buddhism, what is it that's reborn? You know, especially as a Tibetan Lama that he was. And he said, I'm sorry to say your bad habits. You know? <laughs> or your good habits, whatever. But these patterns become our way. Um, and you can notice the patterns of judgment or the patterns of attention or the patterns of love or the patterns of fear, or, you know, the patterns of um, unworthiness or the patterns of care and all those are there. And, and they're very powerful. And when you start to meditate, it's like you look in the mirror and you see these patterns. And most often people want to get rid of their personality. You know, couldn't I get a better personality? and a better body while I'm at it. But it's not, doesn't work that way, you know. You can go to therapy and you can get some facelift or whatever, work out at the gym. But basically you have a body and you have a personality. And they're kind of granted to you in this incarnation and you can work with them, but you have a temperament too. Gandhi said, I have only three enemies. The first and most easily influenced is the entire British Empire, <laughs> right? The second, far more difficult, are the Indian people. And if you've traveled in India, you would understand just what he's saying, right? He said, but my most formidable opponent is a man named Mohandas K. Gandhi. With him, I seem to have very little influence. <laughs> so you start to pay attention and you see the patterns and also how powerful they are. Whew. 
And underneath these patterns are the instinctive forces of life, of survival, of need, of desire, of fear, of longing, of creativity, of love, of connection, that keep life going itself. We're not talking about small things here. The Buddha said, which do you think is more, the water in the four great oceans, or the tears that you've shed over many lifetimes, if you believe in that lifetime stuff, um, from the loss of loved ones, from the separation of things that mattered to you, from the death of people around you, more are the tears, and the, uh, more are the tears you've shed than the waters in the four great oceans. Um, or if you want to just look in a kind of more basic level at the power of these forces, turn on the news. War, racism, just insane, crazy. Um, environmental destruction based on the forces of desire and greed or fear of another or clinging or hatred. Um, they're incredibly powerful forces and they're part of the dance of human incarnation and you have to learn to deal with them because they're here and they're in you. They're in, they're in life. So we're, uh, this is a serious conversation in a way you are born into the human realm, and how are you going to navigate it? Now it's said that there are four particular, four kinds of karma, that is, patterns that have um, different levels of intensity, and they show themselves especially um, when you are near death. Um, and this is all kind of interesting. Maybe I'll talk about it a little bit about death and so forth. Um, but the first is called weighty karma. And it's two sides. In one way, if you killed somebody, for example, it weighs on your soul or your spirit. And at the time of death, you remember that. And it affects what happens if you believe in more than one incarnation, which is true, but you'll wait and see. You see for yourself. <laughs> but also, I've talked about a, a friend and somebody I admire a lot who's one of the leaders in restorative justice in this country, a woman named Sujata Baliga, who was born in, uh, to a family where she was terribly abused and sexually abused and all these things. And she went to Harvard Law School and decided to become a prosecutor and get those guys who were abusing women. But she made herself sick with the rage and anger and pain she carried. And somehow she found her way to listen to the Dalai Lama and left him a note. You know, I need to speak with you. And the next thing she knows, she got a little thing back saying, yes, you know, you, you have an appointment at Thursday at 4 o'clock to come see His Holiness. So she did and told her whole story. And he, he looked at her and he said, so are you, are you finished with the pain of your anger yet? Finished poisoning yourself with it? And she really had to take stock and say yes. And so he taught her loving compassion meditation, forgiveness practice. He sent her to learn meditation. And then he said, you have to work with uh, perpetrators if you're really to free your karma. And she has done. She's done this amazing kind of movement of restorative justice, because everybody almost who's an abuser, if you actually sit with them, was an abused child. They were all abused. They're in this karmic chain of suffering that gets carried on. So weighty karma, she redeemed her karma in some amazing way. Then there's proximate karma. If it's not the heaviest karma, it's the karma of what's been happening at the time near death. Or if it's not proximate karma, it's habitual karma. What state is your mind habitually in? That will be the vision that you carry. And if it's not habitual, then it's called random karma. Um, that is to say, the image is this that's used in the text. Weighty karma is like if you have a meadow with a number of cows and a bull in it, the gate is open, the bull goes first. Everything follows. But if the bull isn't near the gate, then proximate karma, whatever cow is near the gate, goes first through the gate. 
And if there's no cow near, then it's whatever cow, habitual karma, whatever cow is used to going out through the gate. <laughs> and if there isn't any habitual cow, then it's, you know, anybody's guess, random cows. <laughs> But what it starts to tell you, you know, it's not, it's not that you need to have some kind of schema in this way, but more it starts to tell you about the intensity of the patterns, that there's some patterns that you've made that are so powerful in your life, they rule you, and they rule what will happen. And here I have to pause for a moment to talk about what's mysterious, because I told my teacher Ajahn Chah when I first went to the monastery, that I didn't believe in this past and future life stuff. I hadn't had the experiences that I've had since then. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't need to hear any of that kind of nonsense because you can't, you know, how do you know, whatever. And he said, you don't need to believe any of that to find the Dharma of liberation because you're born and you die every day and every moment. That birth and death happens over and over and over and you can watch the patterns of birth and death and see what you're creating moment by moment, and see how you live your life. So you can hold it that way, and that's a very wise way to hold it. But at the same time, there's also something pretty mysterious about being a human being. And in the years of meditation and teaching and doing my own deep practice in Asia and various temples and monasteries, and then also studying past life regression and doing that with people. And then studying with shamans and taking these kind of strange, wild, shamanic journeys and sacred medicine and so forth. I have whatever experience, I've had all these wild experiences, and some of them sure seem like they explain my life or I see it with other people, not just within this incarnation, but that there's some repeated pattern that you get born into to learn about or finish or complete. You might think of it that way, that you actually have a task in this incarnation to learn love or to learn to let go or to make your peace as Sujata. Baliga had to do somehow with the terrible things that happened to her. That, that this life that you've been given is a place of learning and not just a place to get through or some struggle or grim duty in some fashion. And so what do you do with this? Uh, let's see, a couple of stories, more stories tonight. Black Elk, talk about the karma that you make. This great Ogallala Sioux medicine man, the most wonderful one of the century, as he was written about anyway. Um, in Black Elk Speaks, um, Nyhart, the guy who... The, who befriended him and wrote his story, tells about Black Elk's final hike up Harney Peak, which is this mountain in the <clears throat> Dakotas. The Sioux holy man explained that when death approaches, a Lakota could climb this mountain to see if the great spirit approved of their life. Rain would fall on those who had the great spirit's approval. As a young man, Black Elk had sat on that peak and had a vision that told him how to save his people from the soldiers and settlers. In all his years, he worked to fulfill this vision and restore what he called the sacred hoop. But he felt in many ways that he had failed and that the hoop was broken. So the day of his climb, Black Elk was an old man. He dressed in red long johns, moccasins, war paint, and a feathered war headdress. Slowly and laboriously, he climbed to the summit, oblivious to the tourists who stared at him. Nyhart teased him that he should have picked a day with at least one cloud in the sky, but Black Elk rebuked him, saying the rain would have nothing to do with weather. At the top of the peak, not far from the tourists, the old man lay down under a blue sky, and to his astonishment, Nyhart watched as a few small clouds immediately formed over Black Elk, and a soft rain began to fall, and Black Elk wept with relief. He felt that even though he had not succeeded in fulfilling his vision, the Great Spirit was single, signaling him that he had done his best. So there's also something immensely mysterious about our lives. And how we live them also, you know, then becomes what comes back to us, what the universe responds to us with. 
and in a way how we face the magnificent mystery of our own death. There's causative karma, the karma that makes things begin to happen. There's sustaining karma. If you think of a seed in the garden, the causative karma is the seed. There's sustaining karma that keeps it going. Then there's counteractive karma that stops it or slows it down, and destructive karma that puts an end to that particular pattern. And it's always kind of mixed. It's not as simplistic as this booklet that I received in a Chinese restaurant once called the Law of Causality that said, as you sow, so shall you reap, and it had these little aphorisms. If you have problems with your feet, you destroyed bridges in your past lives. <laughs> if you have a fair complexion, you poured lustral offering water on the Buddha statues in past lives. If your children are intelligent, it's because you chanted Buddhist scriptures. If you have problems in love, it means you did not honor, honor your parents properly, and so forth. It's a little simplistic, I think, that way. Um, but there are patterns. There are patterns that we're born into, that we're born with, and that we repeat or that we learn. And they can be mixed. It's not just that simple, straightforward. So the time of the Buddha, the image that was used was of a man who gave this beautiful gift to the monks and to that time supported them. He was a wealthy man, but he was also a bit of a miser and he regretted that he'd given given the gift. Um, so in the next incarnation, as the story was told, whether one believes it or not, um, he was again born quite wealthy, um, but he was also born unhappy because he didn't know what to do with it. He didn't know how to enjoy it. And we have that, I mean, whether you take that literally, it's not necessary. These are really teaching stories. But we have all these voices in us and these patterns. All right. So how do we actually practice with karma? The key is intention. Karma and vipaka. Karma means action and vipaka means result. So we have each moment, each day, sense impressions, sight, sounds, taste, smells, thoughts, feelings, and so forth. The world arises within our experience, sometimes pleasant, sometimes unpleasant, sometimes neutral, sometimes gain, sometimes loss, sometimes praise or blame. Anybody not have that? Just checking, right? Pleasure, pain, gain, loss, joy and sorrow, praise and blame. What karma speaks about is how we respond to that which comes to us. What comes to us, you could say, is the causes and conditions Perhaps it sounds like made by past karma. But the way karma arises is what is our response to the life that's given to us. And that response, that mysterious response, is based on our intention. So it's not the action, but the intention that's the source of karma. So, for example, if you're driving your car and coming home, or you're near your house, and you crash through the hedge and the fence into your neighbor's house, um, destroying part of their living room, okay? If you did it because you were so angry and pissed at your neighbor for the way they'd treated your dog and cut down the tree and whatever they'd done, something that made you indignant, um, very quickly the little blue lights would come and you'd get arrested and have the karma of dealing with that action and its results. If your car coming home crashed through the hedge and the fence and smashed into their living room and so forth because the accelerator stuck and you couldn't stop it and you tried the brakes and, so and it just did it because there was a mechanical problem with your car the exact same action happened. You're sitting there, you're in your car, you're crashing through the yard and the fence into your neighbor's house, but the karmic result is entirely different because your intention was different. 
Can you feel that? So it's not the action that makes karma, but it is the intention. That is the seed of it. With the meditation that we're doing this evening, which is a training in mindfulness or loving awareness, you can become the witness to the patterns and the intentions in your heart and mind. And so you begin to have a conscious or um, genuine possibility of directing the kind of karma that unfolds. Instead of it just being old habit over and over again, when you become aware you can notice the arising of fear or love or hate or anger or, or joy or whatever those emotions are. And you can notice then with this awareness, with loving awareness, what your intention is before you act. Is your intention to be right? You know, to get even, to protect yourself? Is your intention to connect with another person? To, even if you're in a difficulty with them, to look for a thread of, possibility of resolution, the intention that you bring is what makes your karma. And you know it even in the simplest conversation. If you're there in conflict with somebody and you say, what did you mean? You can say that with a different tone of voice. You can say, what did you mean? You know, like kind of pissy and so forth. And they just get more angry, right? How do you dare you say that? Or you can say, what did you mean? I want to understand. And those very same words with a different intention will take the conversation in an entirely different direction. So you start to sense that life presents you, whether you call it karma, it's vipaka actually, with the various experiences of this incarnation that you get to learn from. And what matters is how you respond. We have this very complex circumstance of incarnation, the people that we're close to in our lives, our family, our closest friends. We have the culture around us, the politics, the seasons, and all of this. How do we tend karma? We tend karma by tending our heart and tending our motivation, tending our intention. And you can practice it with your words, you can practice it with your deeds, you can practice it with the the way you drive. I have my driving karma. I drove a cab for three years in Boston. Boston, red lights are just a suggestion, you know. (laughs) It's a pretty unruly world out there, so I've had to work very hard to try to undo some of my driving karma. Um, But those are the places where you get to make or redeem or liberate your heart, make your karma in a different way. And sometimes it means that you have to bear the suffering that you've been given, because you will all have suffering and loss and betrayal of a certain measure, everybody will, without passing it on to somebody else without seeking revenge, without passing on the bitterness. Your life unfolds depending on your heart, depending on the intentions you bring and then the actions that spring from it. Ed Ed Brown, Zen cook, speaking of Zen cooks, wonderful friend who lives in Fairfax. He writes, any moment, this was written long ago, preparing this meal, we could blow up, be gas, a meteor could hit, a bomb could hit, anything could happen. Everything in sight would cease and still we cook. That our lives are tentative, we don't know. Putting a thousand cherished dreams on the table to nourish and reassure those close and dear. In this act of cooking, I bid farewell. Always I insisted you alone were to blame. 
this last instant my eyes open and I regard you with all the tenderness and forgiveness I withheld for so long. And you can feel like in the story of Terry Dobson that there's another way to move through the world and it doesn't mean you pay attention or that you can't stand up for yourself because compassion means that you care for yourself as well as others. But that you can do so tending your heart. And it's what this training of mindfulness, of loving awareness, allows you to do. It's so mysterious. And we really don't get to choose how it unfolds. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You have some good guesses, and you know, there's some good odds. But you're going to get surprised one of these days. You'll see. You will. <laughs> periodically and regularly. It ain't going to be what you think. So how do you do it? Once there was a disciple of a Greek sage who was commanded by his master for three years to give money to everyone who insulted him. When this period of trial was over, the master said, now you can go to Athens and learn wisdom. When this disciple entered the city, he met a certain wise woman who sat at the gate insulting everyone who came and went. He also insulted this disciple, who immediately burst out laughing. Why do you laugh when I insult you, said the wise person, wise woman. Because, said the disciple, for three years I've been paying for this kind of thing, and now you give it to me for free. (laughs) Enter the city, said the wise woman, it is all yours. Mm -hmm. So this is really where, where karma matters. Karma is actually the law of the heart. What do you cultivate? What seeds do you plant? How do you respond? All is mind made. Mind is the forerunner. Most people, said Rabindranath Tagore, believe the mind is like a mirror, more or less accurately reflecting the world. They do not understand that, in fact, the mind is the principal element of creation. So you don't get to possess the world or make it the way you want, but you get to plant your seeds in this garden. And your seeds are the seeds of your words, your actions, and the seeds of your heart. And it is really a great mystery. We go about our day, you know, following the laws of traffic and checking off our to-do list and picking up the mail and cooking and cleaning up and so forth. Every particle of the world is a mirror. In each atom lies the blazing light of a thousand suns. Cleave the heart of a raindrop and a hundred pure oceans will flow forth. Look closely at a grain of sand. The seed of a thousand mountains can be seen. The foot of an ant is larger than an elephant. The drop of water is no different than the Nile River. In the heart of a barley corn lies the fruit of innumerable harvests. In the pupil of the eye, an endless heaven. Though the inner chamber of the heart is small, all the worlds are at home there. This is from Mahmud Mahmud Shabistari. And it is so mysterious. Everything is held in your heart. It's received by your heart, it's known by your heart, it's held in your heart, and the responses of your heart are what create the life that you will have. And it doesn't determine the situation always. You might end up like Aung San Suu Kyi or Nelson Mandela in prison or house arrest. Things can happen. But you also can walk out of house arrest as Aung San Suu Kyi did after 17 years with such metta and courage and loving kindness and and beauty that she carried for those years the hopes of 50 million people in Burma without saying a word to them, but they knew she was there. I tell the story of being in Rangoon a couple years ago before she got released, and I was riding in a taxi, and you couldn't even talk about this stuff because so many people were being arrested and tortured by the military government. But I saw that the guy in my taxi had an Obama bumper sticker on the visor that was down, and I said, all right, 
I said, you like Obama? He said, Obama, Obama, you know. Obama just went to Burma. Anyway, I said, can I ask you something? I said, I, I want you to know that I'm really in favor of her very much. Can I ask you about Aung San Suu Kyi? And he got really frightened, you know, talking about it, you could get locked up. I said, no, 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 She's, I, I admire her, it's really safe. But I want to know, nobody talks about her. You know, have they forgotten her after all these years? Does she still matter to the Burmese people? At the stoplight, the car came to a stop. He turned around. He put his fingers over his lips. He said, never here. And then he put his hand on his heart. Always here. So what's given to you may be beautiful. It may be difficult. It may be the results of this mysterious past patterns that you've made in other lives or who knows what. You'll see. But what really matters is how you tend your life this moment, this day. Tend what comes to you. What matters is the life of your heart. That will determine whether you're happy or unhappy. That will determine whether you're free or not. That will determine the seeds that you plant that last in this world even when you're gone. It will determine what really matters. Ursula Le Guin, she writes, love doesn't just sit there like a stone. It has to be made like bread, remade all the time, made new. And so when Zen Master Suzuki Ryoshi says the goal of meditation practice is to keep a beginner's mind, he says live in the reality of the present with this beginner's mind, with, a, with awareness, with loving awareness, and you can make your life anew each day, each moment. And this is really what karma speaks of. Stories, poems. Mary Oliver's poem called The Buddha's Last Instruction. Every morning as the cloud, as every morning as the east begins to tear off its many clouds of darkness, to send up the first signal, a white fan streaked with pink and violet, I think of the Buddha. An old man, he lay down between two sal trees. He might have said anything knowing it was his final hour. Around him the villagers gathered and stretched forward to listen. And then the sun itself as it blazed over the hills like millions of flowers on fire. Slowly beneath the branches he raised his head, looked into faces of that worried crowd. Make of yourself a light, he said. Make of yourself a light. Mark Morford writes in the San Francisco Guardian, or SF Gate. Stop thinking the global crises, the political problems, all of these things is all there is. Realize that for every war and religious outrage and environmental destruction, there are a thousand counterbalancing acts of staggering generosity and humanity and art and beauty and virtue happening all over the world right now on a breathtaking scale from flower box to cathedral. Resist the temptation to drown in fatalism, to shake your head and sigh, and just throw in the karmic towel. Realize that this is the perfect moment to envision the re-enchantment of the world, to change the energy, to step right up and crank your personal volume right when it all seems dark and bitter and offensive and acrimonious and conflicted and bilious. There's your opening. Remember mystery and finally believe in the seeds you plant, that you are part of a groundswell, a resistance, a seemingly small but actually very, very large impending karmic transformation, a shift, the beginning of something important and potent and unstoppable. 
And the seeds you plant become how your life is lived and who you are and what shines through your eyes and what's passed to your children and what grows in your community. So that more than anything, karma is the tending of your heart. A good friend of mine, a teacher in Seattle named Rodney Smith, was a hospice director of the largest hospice in the Northwest for 15 years. Worked with Ramdas sta- establishing several different hospices. And he was a Buddhist monk for a while. I've known him for years. Anyway, um, in his hospice service, there was an older man who was dying, close to death, who had three or four children. And the children came to Rodney as the hospice director one morning and said, we have a great dilemma. Our father is really close to dying. Rodney understood that. Um, But we just found out today that his younger brother died in a car accident. And we don't know whether to tell him or not. We want him to have a peaceful death. And he's so near death and it would probably just tear him apart. Rodney said, I don't know what you should do. Maybe you should just go be with your father and see what feels right. So they went in the room, Rodney went with him, with them, and they stood there at the bedside and held his hand and looked at him and he was kind of drifting in and out of his coma. And then he looked at them and said, don't you have something to tell me? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, my brother Ben died this morning. How did you know? They said, oh, I've been talking to him. So when you tend your heart, when you tend your own karma, when you tend the intentions of the heart, not in the way that you plan, because you can't manipulate other people. You've tried that. It doesn't work. <laughs> but there's something deeper and more mysterious than that. When you tend your heart, you also, because you are a part of the web of the world, you also change the world. It's true. <laughs>